How's everybody doing? Having a good afternoon? Was, was lunch good? You made it back? You made it back just in time. So the regular announcements, of course, uh, Jeopardy tonight. Wi-Fi is probably still up. Uh, at least it was up half an hour ago. Um, and there's still lock picking going on outside in the tents. If you want to have a conversation, feel free to scoot out into the garden and uh, remain in here because um, this is a special occasion. Um, Arvind is here for his first talk at a conference for all of you. Um, <laughs> so um, he does apps, application security at DocuSign, right? He started out in development but moved into the security space after uh, getting a graduate degree. So he's got a motivation for some developer-friendly things in security, um, and basically taking ways of taking security processes and in integrating them into the development processes. And so right in line with that, he's going to present for you, static code analysis should be for developers, not for you. Thanks, Arvin. Hello. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, it's right after lunch, so I'm pretty sure everybody is super attentive. And uh, thank you, Tukon, for giving me this opportunity. This is my first talk in a conference. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so today I'll be presenting on something I'm really passionate about and have been working on this for past year, uh, making security developer friendly uh, as a whole theme. But uh, in this one, mainly making static code analysis work for developers. Uh, if you don't know what's a static code analysis, it's pretty simple. You have uh, your code in uh, version control, and you use a bunch of tools to scan it to find some obvious bugs that somebody might, uh, developer might have missed. Uh, before we go forward, a simple warning that all the opinions expressed and the tools I call out are my opinions and not of DocuSign in any way. About me, I go by RV, so uh, it's easy to call. Uh, and also, my uh, currently I'm an AppSec engineer at DocuSign. I've, I've been an AppSec engineer at Nike, and uh, I was before that I was a software engineer at VMware. I have a master's degree from computer uh, in computer science at, uh, from ASU. Uh, a special thanks to John Heisman and Skylar Berg, who also worked on this project, and their guidance and work uh, has been incredible. Without that, uh, this could not have been done. So today's agenda is pretty simple. I'll go through what's, what I think is the problem with current static code analysis tools, and what was our solution? What did we build? And, uh, what did I learn in the process and some of the features that I think are important. And finally, I'll end with some unsolicited advice as usual, uh, which is more of a call to action, but anyway. So problem statement. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of metaphors, so I, uh, it's easy to grasp the problem if, uh, through a metaphor. So let's do one. This one. And if you're not familiar with it, which I assume most of the room, is this is from uh, Hindu mythology Ramayana. And the situation is one of the protagonists is hurt in an epic battle. And the healer on the ground says, hey, we can fix him, but we need a specific medicinal plant called Sanjeevani, which only grows in Himalayas. And since it's far, they ask the monkey god Hanuman to bring it. Hanuman goes to Himalayas, finds the mountain, but cannot identify the specific uh, medicinal plant. So instead of bringing that, he brings whole mountain and keeps it on the ground so that the healers can find it and uh, heal the protagonist. This is kind of what the uh, static analysis tool does. We need specific fix, uh, problems to fix our code base. Instead of that, it brings whole mountain and just keeps it uh, before us. The expectation it has is someone, in, uh, someone, a security person, knows what to focus on and what to ignore. But more often than not, it's going to be a developer who's going to be looking at it, and they have their own mountain to climb. And if you keep one more, it's just an obstacle they're going to avoid. To put it into words, uh, the problem, problems are they're monolithic tools trying to s scan every language and every framework that's available. So it's, it's going to be generic. It's a huge task, to be honest. And also, it's built for security professional in the sense they have so much information and uh, you know, uh, help for security professional with their CV, CVSS. All things are great, but a developer needs to know how to fix it and why not fixing it is a problem. That's all they need to know. And since they're casting a wide net to catch everything possible in every place, it's, there are a lot of things that are not bugs. They are mostly uh, you know, false positives. And if you keep getting in the habit of saying, 
oh, ignore that, it's a false positive, they're gonna come to you three times, later they start ignoring without asking you. And it's, it's great, works great as a silo, as its own animal. You can scan whenever it's comfortable for you. It's quick, it uh, it's, works great for you. But it's not integrated with the existing engineering uh, you know, systems. Some vendors are really trying to get there, and they give option, but that's not its primary purpose. So it's, it seems kind of janky if you try to do that. To make my case, I borrowed a slide from my friend, uh, my friend uh, Clint Gibbler, uh, who recently presented in Shellcon about rolling your own uh, SaaS tool. And he makes an interesting case that when should you buy a SaaS tool? And his observations are, let's say if you have modern frameworks, or if you, have, if you want to ship it quickly through CI-CD platform, or if you have invested time in building some safe libraries like we did, which I highly recommend, uh, then it might not be for you. Buying one might not give the best results. And also, he makes an interesting case that even if you buy an off-the-shelf tool, you might end up writing a lot of automation code to work with your system and make it, uh, you know, uh, it's a black box that you don't know what's happening inside. You have to write something else to make it work for you. So inevitably, like, it, it's not more of an option. It's if you want to get some security value out of it, we, uh, you, have, you tend to write your own tool, and that's what we did. But we did not write another scanner, another tool. We wrote a platform, uh, in, because there are already so many scanners, and you know, we have the code, and also grep is amazing. So we, we don't have to keep writing new tools again and again. There are so many uh, you know, open source ones we can use. And so we, can, uh, we used a plug-in model. So you can plug in any tool within two to three hours with little coding. And it's built for developers. Whenever they need and what's the best effective method to give the feedback to them, we use that, we consult with them. And it's not a one-time one process. It's a, an evolving process where you keep uh, making it better and better, improving something if something is not working out for you. So it's trained by our AppSec team, which I have to thank. I'll go through the life cycle of it. Uh, I'll go from both developer and AppSec perspective. It's important to think from developer perspective because if there's a less friction to use the tool or you want, uh, you want them to use something, the more adoptability it has. If you, if you rule with the iron fist and saying, no, you got to use this, they might, but they try to ignore you because it's, if it doesn't fit in your existing system. So from a developer perspective, everything starts at their source control, and we start the process when a new PR is put up so because that's the best place to do it. I'll go into detail later. Uh, but yeah, once it starts, uh, the request comes to CI-CD pipeline, and the CI-CD pipeline uh, works for us because the teams, CI-CD team is our best ally. Instead of you know, uh, going to every team and asking them to involve us or just adding it without telling anyone, we, we uh, work with CICD team to make it part of a pipeline. So anyone gets a new pipeline, our tool comes with, uh, with it. So once CICD sends a request, our, uh, from a developer perspective, our tool, our platform scans the, uh, scans the code and sends back the relevant result. And one more thing we do, do here is we work with the team to uh, to understand what works best for them. What, uh, how do they want to see this result? Not every team uh, you know, wants it the same way. It, their system is different, they have their own process, so we work with them there as well. We also create some security tickets to you know, uh, follow it up or just to have a trail for it, but the whole system is supposed to be seamless, so this, these tickets are not for developers to look at and close and everything, it's for us. Uh, let's say, if they fix the, uh, any problem we found in, uh, in next commit, then this ticket is automatically closed. If not, tickets remains, and one of our uh, AppSec engineers will go in, and they open a bug so that they can come back and fix it. So trying to do as much as booking, bookkeeping for them and just helping them to fix the bug is one of the uh, key for success. And from our perspective, when, our, when, we, get a, when we get the request from uh, CICD pipeline, we do multiple things, but one of the main things we do is cloning the, uh, cloning the code in our local uh, storage and mounting it to our containers. Uh, this, is, this is kind of important, and we scan the files that the PR is touching. This is important because I have seen 
tools which work at the PR level when the PR is put up, they again scan the whole, uh, you know, whole application, which I think is a squandered opportunity because you, ha you have developers at the right moment when they're fixed working on some particular file. So use that opportunity to fix, uh, you know, have them fix on that one. And then we'll send it to our containers. And for most of you, it's pretty obvious why we, why we, we would uh, you know, containerize all our tools. We use multiple scanning tools to scan our code. And it's a hard process. If we have to keep installing it in every box we're going to put our platform in, it's a, it's a lot of work. And also, tools tend to behave differently based on what platform uh, you're running it on, or what OS is, uh, is it. So containerizing it uh, made us easy. And also, it's important that we're not going to use all the scanning tools, all the, all the tools we have on every PR, because it's not required. Uh, we were deciding which tools to use based on, uh, initially based on only on the language. OK, we are scanning this language, so we're going to use these tools. Uh, but we realized, well, some repositories, even though they have the same language, they have different uh, environment in the sense they might have some safe libraries, or they you know, uh, it's an internal one, and we do not have to put some tools, toolings in there. So we added repository as one of the uh, criteria. Then we realized even inside the repositories, some folders and files d um, might need uh, some additional tooling or some exceptions. So we added that. Like, the changes, small changes like that make, uh, can make your false positive rate come lower and lower, and also uh, brings the experience better and better for uh, uh, for the developers, if if you keep saying, "Oh, this tool will generate some uh, you know uh, some bugs for you," but it doesn't apply to you, just go ahead. At some point, it might. So, just work, making the uh, system work for them is the best. And once everything is done, all the details are all the findings are sent back to our platform. Here we do multiple things. Uh, one of the important things we do is uh, filtering of it. So initially, when we started. What, uh, what I did was, like, if you're touching a file, and if you find any finding in that file, we're going to assign or we're going to uh, show it to you. But we quickly got a pushback, a fair pushback that, hey, I'm just changing some part of it code, and other things, I'm not even sure I, uh, what it is. So I'm not responsible for fixing it. And also, it's not a good practice to uh, you know, bunch all the unrelated changes in one PR. So that's a fair pushback, and we uh, agreed with that who smelted delta is not a good idea for, uh, in these situations. And of course, we write everything to data, uh, our database, collect as much as data as possible. Uh, why we did it was even if we currently don't have uh, you know, use cases for that, at some point we will. And having this data is what lets you decide which tools are useful, which are not, and to get some executive buy-in as well. I'll go into detail on some of the features we have. One of the important thing is give, giving feedback at the CI CD uh, in the code review stage. When they put up a PR, the developers and engineers are open to uh, you know, reviews at that point. They are looking for feedback. They want to fix it at that time. So it's better to give at that stage. And also, it's easier and much cheaper to fix at that stage. If you run the tool whenever it's convenient for you and give them a uh, a large amount of findings to fix, uh, fix it, it's hard for them because they're working on something else, the timing not fit, and touching some code is not ideal at that stage. So when they are fixing it, that's the best place to give it to them. And we have three ways of alerting. One, uh, blocking them. Let's say you find something in their PR, and they have to fix it, and, uh, unless that, their PR is blocked. This is more of where we want to get to, we, uh, for, some rep for some teams, we do it, but uh, for many, we don't yet, because either they're a bigger team and they're faster, and we are, uh, it needs a lot of manpower because you need an SLA, you need a page of duty to do it, and we, we need more resources to do that. Two, this was an initial idea that I was really excited about that, hey, if we find anything, we're going to comment on their PR. This seemed like a great idea, and even work with smaller teams, but it didn't work for bigger teams because there are already too many people reviewing and commenting. And an automated tool just comment, keep commenting on your PR so, seems like a spam. And people tend to ignore automated uh, you know, uh, these comments when real people are uh, saying something there. 
So what we ended up with most teams are alerting without blocking. So we alert them saying that, hey, you failed our check, but we don't block you yet. Please fix it. And I honestly believe no developer wants to write shit code. Like, they are good people, but they are constrained by different things. So more than 50% of the time, uh, we have seen people fixing it or just at least asking us, hey, what is this about? Like, how can I uh, go about it? But if they, many, some don't. If they don't, we have a trail of uh, tickets where we can go back and open a bug so that uh, it can be fixed later. Now there is tool plugin model. Uh, this is important because we had a lot of tools uh, we could use. And also, I strongly believe smaller tools with specific purposes are much more good at finding issues or classes of issues so that you can, uh, you, you can fix them. Because they, we are OK with the fact that we might not catch everything, but the things we catch are important, and we are sure about it. So smaller tools with a specific purpose is uh, my jam. And also, there are many uh, you know, open source tools like DevScheme, as my colleague talked about. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's a plugin built for uh, Visual Studio Code, so it's generic. But since it's open source, you can change the, uh, you can change the rules it's scanning on, and you can cut down the rules to bare minimum of what you want it to look for, and write your own custom rules so that you can scan on them. Finding normalization. Uh, I mean, this is specific to our case because it's, you, we are get, using multiple tools and getting multiple details from different kind of findings from different uh, tools. And some tools are amazing at description and other things. Some tools are not. Uh, I literally have a tool which the name of the uh, finding was XSS, and description was cross-site scripting. I mean, I like the simplicity of it. But still, uh, some more description, a detailed one which can help developers would be useful. Uh, key reasons for success, if I have to point out, there are two of them. One, it's built for developers. At every stage, we thought what would make uh, you know, developers' life easy here and how can we help them. And it's also useful in the sense of once you put it, we tested with smaller teams got some buy-in and got their feedback of, OK, this is not working for us, or this specific case doesn't work for us. And we get, we get ambiguous responses from different teams. And it's expected, because not everyone's the same. And uh, we should be OK with rolling, uh, rolling with it. What works for them, as much you work with them, it's better to uh, better get their buy-in and building a great relationship with your developing team. And also, accepting for what it is, a static analysis tools are nothing but automation to catch low-hanging fruits. They're not there to catch amazing bugs. They're not there to you know, replace your pen testers. Uh, if you put all the amazing buzzwords into it, like machine learning, you put oh, you know, artificial intelligence, blockchain for no reason. Like If you add all those things, yeah, it might find some cool bugs, but that's not the expectation. And it's a lot of engineering work. So the expectation is to find some of the uh, you know, mistakes that, that are easy to make by developers that they might ignore and just uh, help them out. And we should be doing that job uh, well. One more thing that worked for us is uh, writing safe libraries and scanning for them and alerting people on that. Uh, my, uh, my colleague talked about it. If you have a more question on that, please talk to Morgan Droman there. And this is not unique. Uh, you know, you, uh, many, many companies have already done that. Because like I, I showed in the initial slide from Clint that the bar for writing your own or the necessity that comes is really low. So you, you tend to write your own. All the bigger companies have done it. Uh, talk to Google and uh, you know, Netflix, uh, Snapchat. All of them have their own system. Because to get uh, some security value out of the existing tools is hard. Uh, these are some of the resources that I re highly recommend. Rolling Your Own is Clint's uh, presentation in ShellCon. And lessons, uh, lessons from Building Static Analysis Core is from OASP, uh, App, uh, AppSec OASP in California last, uh, early this year. My boss talked there. It's amazing. And this, oh, sorry. That's this one. The lessons from building at, uh, at Google, that's a... Uh, that's a paper that Google released, which I learned amazing things from. Uh, it's like a gold standard, I, I, at least in my mind, and I learned a lot of things from there. And the last tool, like while our tool, 
uh, is we started it as a POC, so it's still not an open source tool. We're working on it. It's highly embedded to our, this thing, uh, our environment. But one of the similar tools is Husky CI, uh, whose team I met in DEFCON. They're amazing. They're, uh, all the features I mentioned are not there, uh, but they are doing amazing work, and they are uh, pretty cool to talk to. Uh, just check it out if you're interested in uh, using one of these tools. Uh, unsolicited advice. Well, I'm kind of ending it in an anticlimactic you know, message here. Because as much as I love building it and enjoyed the process and we are getting some value out of it, I don't think it's a good way for the whole industry to keep writing in every company we go to. Because it's, uh, it's not feasible, it's not scalable, and huge waste of resource. We should be working towards uh, this goal. And we are doing all this after I mean, uh, all the vendors have put a lot of work into it. They're smart people, but I think they're uh, focusing on wrong things. And also, trying to fit in the existing ecosystem of developers, what's useful for them, what we can, uh, how we can help them out. Fixing, uh, fitting in that uh, context is very important. And also, we're also pretty good at finding bugs. You know, it's amazing. Like, we, are, we love finding bugs, it's fun. You know, you can, we can just call out people. That's why we are in security anyway. Uh, but like, let's, we have to uh, you know, build the process to fix them. It's, uh, it's time for us to focus on and helping and enabling all the developers who are doing amazing things with empathy to fix it. Uh, because again, I strongly believe coming from a uh, development background, I don't think developers want to write bad code. They just not have the uh, resources and the support to uh, do it. And since I started with the mythological metaphor, it's only fair if I end with the, some shit metaphor. So this whole situation is like diapers. You know, diapers are for kids, but it's bought by their parents, and the marketing is always towards, you know, aimed towards parents. So as an industry, we have, uh, as an industry, we, we do the same thing. It's used by developers, the static analysis tools, but bought by security professionals. As an industry, we have done a great job of marketing it to uh, us, uh, security professionals, and making us uh, feel it's important. But now it's time to catch the shit kids made. So let's focus on that. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions? Hey, uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. So I, I, I get that, like, uh, trying to do this QA process for catching bugs earlier on um, in the development process is good because you can, you know, get kind of earlier access to things that go wrong. But in environments that have a whole bunch of different development teams working, adding code into the same code base, um, how, do you, how do you reconcile, like, maybe bug fixes that cause more bugs um, and different situations like that or development teams that are from disparate um, parts of the world and work differently together. How do you, what's your advice for that? Uh, yeah, I, I really think in doing whatever you can, uh, as much fancy tools you have, the most important thing is to build a really solid relationship with the developers, with the security team. I do think, and also uh, in one of the slides I show, can share, uh, I'll share it uh, in LinkedIn later, that we don't tell them, like when, when they go to see our, the details of our finding, we don't tell them that, oh, this, is, this has CVS a score of this, that, this, and everything. We say specific things like, what's the problem and how to fix it? And for some of them, yes, I agree, like uh, there are no uh, universal fixes. And in those cases, we always encourage, like we have the link to directly contact us there. Uh, I know it's a complex problem. I don't have a perfect answer for that. But at least what has worked for us is a long-standing uh, relationship with developing teams where they can come to us at any time and we will work with their situation rather than saying, no, this is a bug. This is how you fix it. This is, this is the uh, ultimate rule. Uh, so yeah, that has worked great for us. Thank you. Thank you. So we're actually going to shuffle outside for additional questions. So thank you very much, Arvind. Um, and thank you all. give him a round of applause.